chapter 10, The Tower of Babel. This chapter is based on Genesis 9, 25 through 27, and chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. To repeople the desolate earth, which the flood had so lately swept from its moral corruption, God had preserved but one family, the household of Noah, to whom he had declared, Thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Yet in the three sons of Noah was speedily developed the same great distinction seen in the world before the flood. In Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who were to be the founders of the human race, was foreshadowed the character of their posterity. Noah, speaking by divine inspiration, foretold the history of the three great races to spring from these fathers of mankind. Tracing the descendants of Ham through the son rather than the father, he declared, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. The unnatural crime of Ham declared that filial reverence had long before been cast from his soul, and it revealed the impiety and vileness of his character. These evil characteristics were perpetuated in Canaan and his posterity, whose continued guilt called upon them the judgments of God. On the other hand, the reverence manifested by Shem and Japheth for their father, and thus for the divine statutes, promised a brighter future for their descendants. Concerning these sons it was declared, Blessed be Jehovah, God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. The line of Shem was to be that of the chosen people, of God's covenant, of the promised Redeemer. Jehovah was the God of Shem. From him would descend Abraham and the people of Israel, through whom Christ was to come. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 144, verse 15. And Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem. In the blessings of the gospel, the descendants of Japheth were especially to share. The posterity of Canaan descended to the most degrading forms of heathenism. Though the prophetic curse had doomed them to slavery, the doom was withheld for centuries. God bore with their impiety and corruption until they passed the limits of divine forbearance. Then they were dispossessed, and became bondmen to the descendants of Shem and Japheth. The prophecy of Noah was no arbitrary denunciation of wrath or declaration of favor. It did not fix the character and destiny of his sons. But it showed what would be the result of the course of life they had severally chosen, and the character they had developed. It was an expression of God's purpose toward them and their posterity, in view of their own character and conduct. As a rule, children inherit the dispositions and tendencies of their parents and imitate their example, so that the sins of the parents are practiced by the children from generation to generation. Thus the vileness and irreverence of Ham were reproduced in his posterity, bringing a curse upon them for many generations. One sinner destroyeth much good. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 18. On the other hand, how richly rewarded was Shem's respect for his father, and what an illustrious line of holy men appears in his posterity. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and his seed is blessed. Psalm 37, verses 18 and 26. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. For a time, the descendants of Noah continued to dwell among the mountains where the ark had rested. As their numbers increased, apostasy soon led to division. Those who desired to forget their Creator and to cast off the restraint of His law felt a constant annoyance from the teaching and example of their God-fearing associates, and after a time they decided to separate from the worshippers of God. Accordingly, they journeyed to the plain of Shinar, on the banks of the river Euphrates. They were attracted by the beauty of the situation and the fertility of the soil, and upon this plain they determined to make their home. 
Here they decided to build a city, and in it a tower of such stupendous height as should render it the wonder of the world. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations. The dwellers on the plain of Shinar disbelieved God's covenant that he would not again bring a flood upon the earth. Many of them denied the existence of God and attributed the flood to the operation of natural causes. Others believed in a supreme being and that it was he who had destroyed the antediluvian world, and their hearts, like that of Cain, rose up in rebellion against him. One object before them in the erection of the tower was to secure their own safety in case of another deluge. By carrying the structure to a much greater height than was reached by the waters of the flood, they thought to place themselves beyond all possibility of danger. And as they would be able to ascend to the region of the clouds, they hoped to ascertain the cause of the flood. The whole undertaking was designed to exalt still further the pride of its projectors and to turn the minds of future generations away from God and lead them into idolatry. When the tower had been partially completed, a portion of it was occupied as a dwelling place for the builders. Other apartments, splendidly furnished and adorned, were devoted to their idols. The people rejoiced in their success and praised the gods of silver and gold and set themselves against the ruler of heaven and earth. Suddenly, the work that had been advancing so prosperously was checked. Angels were sent to bring to naught the purpose of the builders. The tower had reached a lofty height, and it was impossible for the workmen at the top to communicate directly with those at the base. Therefore, men were stationed at different points, each to receive and report to the one next below him the orders for needed material or other directions concerning the work. As messages were thus passing from one to another, the language was confounded, so that material was called for which was not needed and the directions delivered were often the reverse of those that had been given. Confusion and dismay followed. All work came to a standstill. There could be no further harmony or cooperation. The builders were wholly unable to account for the strange misunderstandings among them, and in their rage and disappointment they reproached one another. Their confederacy ended in strife and bloodshed. Lightnings from heaven, as an evidence of God's displeasure, broke off the upper portion of the tower and cast it to the ground. Men were made to feel that there is a God who ruleth in the heavens. Up to this time all men had spoken the same language. Now those that could understand one another's speech united in companies. Some went one way and some another. The Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, this dispersion was the means of peopling the earth, and thus the Lord's purpose was accomplished through the very means that men had employed to prevent its fulfillment. But at what a loss to those who had set themselves against God! It was His purpose that as men should go forth to found nations in different parts of the earth, they should carry with them a knowledge of His will, that the light of truth might shine undimmed to succeeding generations. Noah, the faithful preacher of righteousness, lived for three hundred and fifty years after the flood, Shem for five hundred years, and thus their descendants had an opportunity to become acquainted with the requirements of God and the history of His dealings with their fathers. But they were unwilling to listen to these unpalatable truths. They had no desire to retain God in their knowledge, and by the confusion of tongues, they were, in a great measure, shut out from intercourse with those who might have given them light. 
the Babel builders had indulged the spirit of murmuring against God. Instead of gratefully remembering his mercy to Adam and his gracious covenant with Noah, they had complained of his severity in expelling the first pair from Eden and destroying the world by a flood. But while they murmured against God as arbitrary and severe, they were accepting the rule of the cruelest of tyrants. Satan was seeking to bring contempt upon the sacrificial offerings that prefigured the death of Christ, and as the minds of the people were darkened by idolatry, he led them to counterfeit these offerings and sacrifice their own children upon the altars of their gods. As men turned away from God, the divine attributes, justice, purity, and love, were supplanted by oppression, violence, and brutality. The men of Babel had determined to establish a government that should be independent of God. There were some among them, however, who feared the Lord, but who had been deceived by the pretensions of the ungodly and drawn into their schemes. For the sake of these faithful ones, the Lord delayed His judgments and gave the people time to reveal their true character. As this was developed, the sons of God labored to turn them from their purpose. But the people were fully united in their heaven-daring undertaking. Had they gone on unchecked, they would have demoralized the world in its infancy. Their confederacy was founded in rebellion. A kingdom established for self-exaltation, but in which God was to have no rule or honor. Had this confederacy been permitted, a mighty power would have borne sway to banish righteousness, and with it peace, happiness, and security from the earth. For the divine statutes, which are holy and just and good, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, men were endeavoring to substitute laws to suit the purpose of their own selfish and cruel hearts. Those that feared the Lord cried unto him to interpose. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. In mercy to the world he defeated the purpose of the tower builders and overthrew the memorial of their daring. In mercy he confounded their speech, thus putting a check on their purposes of rebellion. God bears long with the perversity of men, giving them ample opportunity for repentance. But he marks all their devices to resist the authority of his just and holy law, from time to time the unseen hand that holds the scepter of government is stretched out to restrain iniquity. Unmistakable evidence is given that the Creator of the universe, the One infinite in wisdom and love and truth, is the supreme ruler of heaven and earth, and that none can with impunity defy His power. The schemes of the Babel builders ended in shame and defeat. The monument to their pride became the memorial of their folly. Yet, men are continually pursuing the same course, depending upon self and rejecting God's law. It is the principle that Satan tried to carry out in heaven, the same that governed Cain in presenting his offering. There are tower builders in our time. Infidels construct their theories from the supposed deductions of science and reject the revealed word of God. They presume to pass sentence upon God's moral government. They despise His law and boast of the sufficiency of human reason. Then, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. In the professedly Christian world, many turn away from the plain teachings of the Bible and build up a creed from human speculations and pleasing fables, and they point to their tower as a way to climb up to heaven. Men hang with admiration upon the lips of eloquence while it teaches that the transgressor shall not die that salvation may be secured without obedience to the law of God. If the professed followers of Christ would accept God's standard, it would bring them into unity. But so long as human wisdom is exalted above His holy word, there will be divisions and dissension. 
The existing confusion of conflicting creeds and sects is fitly represented by the term Babylon, which prophecy, Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, and chapter 18, verse 2, applies to the world-loving churches of the last days. Many seek to make a heaven for themselves by obtaining riches and power. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Psalm 73, verse 8, trampling upon human rights and disregarding divine authority. The proud may be for a time in great power and may see success in all that they undertake, but in the end they will find only disappointment and wretchedness. The time of God's investigation is at hand. The Most High will come down to see that which the children of men have builded. His sovereign power will be revealed. The works of human pride will be laid low. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Psalm 33, verses 13, 14, 10, and 11.